Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. So today we are going to talk about impressionist music. We're gonna talk about the era, the composers who influenced the era, such as Debussy, the style, the characteristics, and all that good stuff. We are also going to listen to a few examples of impressionist music so you can just get it in your head. So whether you're watching this video because you're studying for a test or you're just like an overall music enthusiast, I hope you find something of use and of interest here. And I also did something that I've never done before. I don't know why, because it was super fun, is I made a Spotify playlist. So if you click in the description bar, you'll find a link to that on my website, pianotv.net. And I just put like three hours of impressionist music together. So if you're into that. Anyway, let's get started. <laughs> It all began with Monet's painting, Impression Sunrise. Monet, as you probably know, was the most famous Impressionist painter, and the term was borrowed from that painting. This one right here on the screen. So the whole idea with Impressionism was that musicians and artists were drawn to conveying moods with their music instead of distinct parts and melodies. They wanted their pieces to evoke a feeling. So this music was less fixated on details and making things, you know, picture perfect. So oftentimes the music is actually the opposite. It's vague, it's blurred, but still impactful. So let's look at the, some of the specific parts that made Impressionist music unique. Instruments were played in brand new ways, like flutes and clarinets were playing darker, lower sounds, and the harshness of horns were mellowed by mutes. And then you had like tinkly, shimmery instruments that were used like the harp, the triangle, and the glockenspiel to add some new effects. Up until this point, chords hadn't really gone wild yet. Like there were lots of chords, like there were minor sevenths and diminished chords and all that stuff, but we didn't really start getting nines and 11s and 13s and stuff like that in earnest until the Impressionist era. These are basically regular chords that get notes added to them in intervals of three to make them a little bit less clear and a little bit more dissonant. Another common thing with chords during this time is that they didn't always resolve in a normal way, a la cadences. This lack of resolution just leaves the listener feeling like they aren't anchored in any one key. And they're kind of like floating through a keyless dreamland, which leads us to a tonality or lack of a tonal center. So impressionist music really like going outside of the key box. Now, most of us are familiar with the whole major minor modality thing. Basically, all I'm saying is when a song is based in a specific key and it's a major or minor key. Impressionist composers like to write songs that weren't in any key at all. And that's what we call a tonality. Using different scales. So another way composers escaped the whole chains of major and minor modality was to explore different harmonies and different keys. This led to a return to slightly more ancient style, like medieval music type concepts, such as modes and using harmonies of fourths and fifths, which sound really strange to our modern ears. We're used to harmonies of thirds and pleasant ones like that. Exotic Eastern scales came into play, like the whole tone scale, which Debussy was super fascinated by. He was also inspired by other aspects of music from the Far East, such as different rhythms, different instruments, and that kind of thing. And then we have the pentatonic scale, which was popular as well. Pentatonic is a five note scale, penta equals five, that originates with folk music from all different kinds of places, from Scotland to Ireland to China. And lastly, rhythm. A lot of impressionist music lacks a steady defined rhythm. It's more fluid, more changeable. It's not the kind of music that you're necessarily going to tap your toes to. So the timeline of the impressionist period began in the 1870s with painters like Monet and ended in the mid 1920s ish. So of course, impressionist music carried on beyond that point in different offshoots like neo impressionism. But I like to think of the dates of impressionism coinciding with Monet. So starting with his painting that basically spawned the, the name of the period and ending with his death. The style of Impressionist music isn't as deeply emotional or personal like romantic music. So with romantic music, the composers were really fixated on telling a story. So um, they would explore all kinds of like deep, intense emotions, everything from like joy, sorrow, rage, despair, death, like all those big things was like, they were looking at it from the perspective of a first person narrative. So when you have a first person narrative, the main character is your point of view. They are like in there getting all the action, but they can't see things clearly. Whereas when you have a third person storyteller, there's someone who's kind of like standing outside of the whole thing. It's almost like they're, they're a distant observer and they can see everything clearly. And that's sort of 
of how impressionist music works. It's kind of like, sort of like an outside perspective looking in. The motto, you could consider the motto of impressionist music to be suggest and evoke, but don't describe. Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel were the main men of Impressionist music. They were both French composers active at the turn of the 20th century and beyond. Now, Debussy and Ravel, actually, they didn't really like when their music was referred to as Impressionist. Debussy much preferred the term symbolism when referring to his music, as that was the literary movement that directly inspired him and his music. Here's, here's one thing that Debussy was quoted as saying in a letter. Imbeciles call it impressionism, a term employed with utmost inaccuracy. So uh, Debussy thinks we're imbeciles. Let's, let's just carry on then. Other composers who were influenced by impressionism includes all these other guys on the list, notably Albanese, Manuel de Falla was a pretty big one, and of course, Eric Satie and some of these others. You can read the list. You don't need me to read them all out to you. So we're going to talk a little bit about Debussy, who was a very talented musician, and he was like an intrepid explorer. Debussy didn't set out to, he, he didn't say to himself, like, I'm going to write impressionist music, because as we've already established, he did not like that comparison. What he was concerned about was just like pushing the boundaries of music and going outside of the box. Debussy went to a French academy where he studied music, and they did not like this tendency of his. His music was often described as bizarre or courting the unusual. Just so we can get a sense of Debussy's opinion on formal music education, I just want to share this quote. He says, I love music passionately, and because I love it, I try to free it from barren traditions that stifle it. It is a free art gushing forth, an open air art, boundless as the elements, the wind, the sky, the sea. It must never be shut in and be become an academic art. When we talk about what composers are inspired by, a lot of the times the answer is religious in nature. So like a lot of composers were inspired and wrote for God. Some composers were inspired by their pets, like that video we did not too long ago. But for Debussy, his religion was mysterious nature. And this was his major source of inspiration for his compositions, a lot of them being nature-based, like La Mer, Claire de Lune, and so on. Here's another quote of Debussy's that I really love, and I feel like it captures his passion and style more than any like music analysis could. So I'll just let Debussy speak for himself. When I gaze at the, a sunset sky and spend hours contemplating its marvelous, ever-changing in beauty, an extraordinary emotion overwhelms me. Nature in all its vastness is truthfully reflected in my sincere, though feeble soul. Around me are the trees stretching up their branches to the skies, the perfumed flowers gladdening the meadow, the gentle grass carpeted earth, and my hands unconsciously assume an attitude of adoration. Let's take a listen to the first arabesque from Debussy's De Arabesque, because this exemplifies so many characteristics of Impressionist music all in one song. You've got a harp-like arpeggiated movement going on. You've got like a pentatonic tune in the right hand, and then you have this like freeform sense of, you don't feel tied by rhythm. Maurice Ravel was in the generation after Debussy, and he's widely considered to be one of France's most awesome composers. And him and Debussy had tons of things in common. They both wrote in an impressionist style. They both hated that comparison. They both were not suited to academy life. So you think they could be friends, but the problem is they were so similar that they each had like staunch supporters on either side, and that kind of created like a rivalry and a tension. Think about it like, in the 90s where you had like the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and people who liked the Backstreet Boys thought people who liked NSYNC were crazy. They like made fun of them. That's kind of how their relationship was. One major difference between Ravel and Debussy is that Ravel was more of a classicist. He really liked taking older forms and revitalizing them with something fresh, as opposed to like completely inventing new things. So for example, later in life, he was really influenced by jazz and he brought that into his classical compositions. But the piece I wanna show you of Ravel's is my personal favorite, and therefore maybe it's a little more unusual of a choice, but I do think it captures the so-called impressionist style. 
The song is called Je Do, and it's written in 1901. And I just have a little quote here. I've been like, quote, partying today. This is what Ravel has to say about it. Basically, this piece was inspired by the sounds of water. And you will hear that immediately when we play a clip of it. The last example we'll listen to today is a work that was highly praised by Debussy, among others, as being one of the most brilliant piano works. It is super difficult and it is the Iberia Suite by Albanese. It's also very long, it's a collection of 12 pieces, and we're just going to listen to obviously like an example of one of them. It's composed between 1905 and 1908, and it, it exemplifies the impressionist style, but from the perspective of a Spanish composer. So it has a completely different flair. The one we're gonna listen to, El Puerto, is based on a Spanish dance style called the Zapateado. I butchered that pronunciation, but you just bear with me in my Englishness. Englishness. I just wanted to throw this example in there to show that not all impressionist style music is without a beat, without rhythm. This one definitely has rhythmic flair, but you'll also be able to pick out some unusual chords and harmonies in there, especially if you listen to the full version beyond the clip that I'm gonna show you. So instead of just showing you a few music examples and leaving it at that, I mentioned this at the beginning, but I made a playlist on Spotify. I think it has something like 32 songs, three hours of music. It's basically just a, a big collection of music, a lot of Debussy, a lot of Ravel, but also some other guys like Albanese. And I think it just like kind of encompasses the idea of impressionist music, if you want to listen to it. And all that you can find in the description bar below in the link to the accompanying blog post at pianotv.net. And that is all for today's video. I hope you enjoyed this tour through impressionist music. If you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a like, share it with your friends if you think your friends would like it. I always appreciate that so then we can like get more people into classical music. It's like, it's like my mission. With that said, I will catch you guys next time. leaving it all the so instead of just showing you a few musical